Well, welcome back, everyone. This is episode <coughs> 35. 36. 36. But who's counting? Anyway, of the, the Journey of Integral Recovery podcast. And we've been rolling, and this thing's getting out, and it's been uh, oh, it's just been wonderful to be able to to talk about this and with our guests and with everyone out there. So, um, and again, I'm John Dupuy, and that's uh, a distinguished looking gentleman up there is Dr. Bob Weathers, and the distinguished uh, younger gentleman down there is Douglas Prater. Thank you, John. We are the Integral Recovery Journey of Integral Recovery podcast team, and we're here to talk about all things uh, that are involved in the process of getting better and getting well. And, you know, and, and, and last we had a, uh, we, last week we spoke with Holly Whitaker. I hope you guys have uh, caught that. And if you're not, you got to go back. Mm-hmm. And she's the founder of Hip Sobriety and this wonderful, incisive, vulnerable, strong, courageous, honest woman with a great sense of humor. And, um, um, I don't know where it's going with that, but you, you yeah, you check it out. It's, it was really, really an inspiration for us. And yeah. uh, oh, the, what I was going to say is that it's becoming clear and clear whether you're an addict, alcoholic, or not. Uh, we all need to do this kind of work that we're advocating here. We all need to do the practice if we're really going to become the people that we need to be. You know, we're, we need to be become the parents, the leaders, the teachers, the everything. We just really have to work. It takes practice, and uh, we're just beginning to discover that. And finally, we're getting to a place where we don't have to be fractured, partial human beings. You know, we can really come in with our whole selves, and we're learning how to cultivate that and do that on a daily basis. So that's a that's a great story. So yeah. that's yeah. what I wanted to say. So Bob, yeah, or, yeah. Uh, I I want to I want to mention something. I I I've thought about it earlier in one of our previous podcasts. Is that just uh, yesterday, I, was, I had two conversations where I pointed towards both of you, you, John, and you, Doug, as being exemplars of, um, of uh, being committed to integral practice. Both of you are extremely fit, and I was uh, speaking of both of you, and you become models then for carrying fitness physically, uh, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and it feels really good to me that, that the three of us are uh, doing our darndest to develop ourselves and so that what we're talking about is actually embodied uh, uh, in, in our lives. And I say that be- because it's not a given at all in the recovery community. And I want to be careful about this because it, it could be you just come across this kind of rank, rank judgmentalism. But it's sad to me when I see a contradiction between those that would promote a recovery and, 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 and that for reasons of human limitations, aren't modeling what it is they're talking about. And so you guys know this as well as I. There's plenty of people, uh, I'm, I'm aware of it uh, because I've been more involved in the men's side of things, plenty of men that uh, are literally abstinent from their drug of choice but hopelessly overweight or, or out, of, out of tone physically. I'm not even going to get into talking about what it's like to hear people talk about sobriety and be so obviously emotionally unbalanced. And that comes from my bias as a psychologist, but that here we are in a community that we're all imperfect uh, vehicles for sure, but there's a real commitment to honing and even perfecting the containers, the vessels that we are. I really appreciate that. I point to both of you guys, and I did, as I said yesterday, with great pride because you guys are exemplars of what it is that represents the the aim or the goal here. And every woman, every man can look to you as inspiration for whatever it is they need to do. So I just wanted to name that right out of the starting gate. Bob, this stuff saved my life. I mean, I do my practices every day. I I teach doing practices every day because they worked for me and they continue to work for me. And that's the whole foundation of everything. And they're all interconnected to, you know, doing the, doing the exercise every day gets me to a better place mentally where I'm more able to do the emotional work where my neural connections are strengthened and I can sink deeper into my meditation to deepen that spiritual connection where I can study and retain and grow intellectually on a deeper level. They, they all empower one another. And so Yeah. Setting that foundation, starting my day that way every day is I, what's made this whole thing possible. So it's easy for me to model because I discovered long before I met you guys that it worked. And so I hope yeah. that we can continue to communicate that to everyone out there. Um, it does. It does. 
get easier over time and more and more rewarding as you progress with this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we just finished uh, our previous podcast was with Holly Whitaker and um, one of the things she talked about, I really appreciate it. I'm going to respond to you in just a second, Doug. I really appreciate something that, that was at the tail end of the podcast is that Holly is such a, 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 an advocating voice for the ultimate coolness, hence hip sobriety, the ultimate hipness of sobriety. And I, I want to uh, bring in, because uh, Doug, you model this, John, you model this in every conversation. You talk about living a vital life, a vital creative life. You're musicians, you're athletes, you're learned, uh, you're pushing your, your edges always in terms of shadow work and so on. And to establish that as, in a sense, the new normal or the new hip or the new cool. And one of the things that's implied in that conversation with, with Holly, and I'd love to talk into this with you guys, is that there's, uh, I've done a lot of work myself, and I think all of us are quite familiar with the societal stigma towards the, uh, the addict. <clears throat> in fact, we talked really helpfully in that previous podcast about the problem of using terminology. Labeling someone as an alcoholic or an addict is not without problems. And with all due respect to the 12-step tradition, it's probably worth re-examining again and again how how can we language the way that we talk about this affliction without it turning into a label that becomes almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy? There's a problem with that. But on a, that's a separate conversation. That was a value. But, but the stigma in society towards you know, the, 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 the moral weakness or the aberration of the person that struggles with addiction, that's patently obvious. And it's at the very root of shame in terms of where I internalize that stigma and I basically, uh, psychology calls shame self-stigmatization. It's basically where you internalize societal uh, judgment. But there's another nuance that was revealed with, with Holly and it was this, is that what about the stigma about being in recovery? What about the stigma of not, uh, not uh, turning to my addiction, not overeating, not over drinking, not drugging, uh, whatever the other addictions are, um, I'd love to talk into that with you guys, is that how do we establish a beachhead for actually making quite desirable what's self-evident? The three of us are all committed to integral growth, but how do we create a momentum in our own local sphere and also enlarge that to where it's, it's, it's not necessarily so cool to go the path of least resistance? I think 90%, I think I read the percentage, 90% of American adults drink alcohol um, with with some regularity, this is not talking about addiction. It's just it's it's a huge percentage, you guys. It was like unbelievable, and it made it clear to me that you're in a minority by definition if you don't drink. How do we make that a minority position? Let's say, just speaking of of alcohol, how do we make that clear that it's not only uh, it's not a default because I I can't drink like normal people because I'm fucked up, rather that make it absolutely uh, desirable as an end goal. Uh, maybe not as an end goal, but as a means to an end goal, which is developing my full personhood. I think Holly really articulates that, but I open that up for us to look at. Well, when I was a, oh, when I was a teenager back in the 90s, I was uh, really involved with punk rock, which led mm -hmm. to a lot of my early philosophical exploration, etc. And I remember in the punk rock movement, there was a particular subset of those people who were what we termed straight edge. Straight edge and right. they were the ones who weren't using drinking doing anything like that at all they were 100 percent on the level straight edge and they were the most subversive set of people in that movement they were you know far cooler because because it gave them that extra mental edge to know what yeah. was going on to see the yeah. problems with society and the delusions and the lies etc cetera, etc cetera, because their minds weren't clouded by all this crap I think if we can model that, you know, continue to show up in that way, we'll be making a lot of progress in the right That's direction. That's perfect. That's perfect. Straight edge as desirable. That's awesome. That's awesome. I didn't know about that. That's very cool to me. If you want to be radically punk, it reminds me of Noah Levine with Dharma punks. If you want to be a punk, be a Dharma punk. That's some radical shit, man. <laughs> yeah, I loved his book. His book was a huge inspiration in my early recovery, too. Yeah. We'll have to have yeah, him on as a guest. As long as we don't become sober fascists and we beat the shit out of people who are using, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, 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 I, I ran into some straight edge. They're like, man, they're not they're, they're knife edge. I mean, it was a really. Yeah, no, that's a good point, John, is that you can turn that into a reverse kind of discrimination. It's like if in the spirit of what you're saying, Doug, if I can become straight edge 
and straight edge means be, being even more adequate to an integral task of embracing everything and everybody, including in myself. That's some serious straight edge, and that would be the that would be the the, the absolute antidote to fascism. It seems like to me is integral uh, process, integral maturity is 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 the solution to fascism. Well, is it cool to smoke cigarettes these days? Uh, it's growing it's growing more and more people are smoking more and more young people are smoking for example it's it's uh you know vaping and so on like that so i mean i I, you're not asking about my personal judgment but just like i think it's uh, it's a rite of passage like holly was talking about it's a rite of passage to drink i there's a uh, the vast majority of of adolescents it's it's a rite of passage and the same with smoking is it's actually sad but it's increasing with with the with the uh, the, the availability the availability of vaping so did, did you guys smoke cigarettes i i most certainly did i can i started smoking when i was fairly young and i continued that a couple of years into my recovery um yeah yeah i thought it was cool to wait till i was 45 john i never inhaled a cigarette till i was 45 when i tell this to the addicted individuals in recovery with whom i work they laugh me out of the building it's just it's it's like you talking about using cocaine twice john i used cocaine twice within like 24 hours or something you know it's 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 like uh yeah Yeah, yeah. Well, I smoked for a long time, and Did you? Uh, and I've had you know students who are heroin addicts say it's harder to quit smoking cigarettes than than heroin. You know, yeah. I've had that. So it's one of the before. sadnesses to me in the treatment center where I work, and I say this with grief, is that virtually all the clients in between groups that we lead are outside vaping. And uh, and I, yeah. and I talk about it. I don't I don't not talk about it. I talk about it in terms of dopamine spikes. And how it is that 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 you're getting a constant spike like this every time you smoke? Every time I slam down a, a cup of hypercaffeinated coffee, it's not the same as heroin. It's not the same as meth, but it's going into the same neural pathways. And you know, we take baby steps. And I really feel gracious. I don't feel straight edge about that in terms of being fascist. But I feel like it's not fair to not. Uh, not talk about it you know if, if i'm eating a shitload of carbohydrates so i can jack up my sugar it's it's going into the same pathway it's priming my brain for relapse is what it's doing yeah and when when i was working in the wilderness of course we didn't smoke up <clears throat> and uh my home you're not gonna smoke and it, it, people who are really you know flipping out we'd give them nicotine gum you know to get them over the withdrawals sure. yeah but yeah it's like i'm i'm really done I'm done with cigarettes and it took a long time and I would crave them. And especially when I go perform or something, I have this thing, you know, before I get up on stage and play, I'd, I'd have a cigarette. And then now it's like, I'm really, I'm done. It's like, you know, it says in the big book, eventually it's like putting your hand on a hot stove. just not something you're going to do. I get really grossed out when I see people smoking and I get kind of upset when, especially when I see young people, yeah, it's hard. you know, it's like hurting yourself so much. So I, I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. That maybe maybe we can change that paradigm from being cool to not cool. I'm not sure. My perception, my observation is that with smoking cigarettes, that ship has sailed and it's already not cool to smoke cigarettes anymore. Um, mm-hmm. Now there may be an uptick in people who are starting to do things like vaping, but uh, I mean, cigarettes, <laughs> the cool ship sailed a long time ago because people modeled something different. People modeled a different mm-hmm. behavior. And mm-hmm. uh, like we were talking about with Holly around the advertising and everything last time, the kids, if you flip on MTV these days, you see not any music, unfortunately, but the advertisements are all about being the generation to end it and making it cool to not mm. smoke anymore. And mm. there's mm. some really good messaging involved in things like that. That's I great. see, you know, out even here in my rural town, fewer and fewer people, young people smoking than I ever have you know, back mm. in the 90s, back in the early 2000s. Mm. I feel like that's on the way out. And really, that's something that is changing fast yeah. it's not only the advertising and the messaging there but um this comes back to stigma too that our society has around addiction the more the the people who are living beautiful lives that we look up to as role models a lot of them are sober and we just don't know it the more we yeah. open up this conversation the more we can model that sobriety and doing the practices is what enables these kind of lives that we all aspire to and we all want to have um in in doing that and being open about the journey that got us there and the things that are working for us and not inherently condoning the cultural promotion of other behavior that is happening we start to 
change the perception of what's cool on a yeah. global societal level. Yeah. You know, when I, I, I it, it came to me this week, you guys, and I want to talk about it with you to see what your experiences have been. Um, I was aware this week, it was very apparent to me yesterday in the group I led, and I got feedback at the, end, at the end of the group. I said, how did this group go for you guys? And so people gave me feedback and I'm not, I'm not there for self-congratulation. I'm really interested in feedback. And one of the things I'm feeling, it's right into the heart of what both of you are saying is that, that if I can show up as a 62 year old man who talks openly about having been addicted and having uh, conquered that by virtue of, of, a lot of support and a fair bit of grit and and really committed to uh, this is the point really committed to living a vital uh, uh, vibrant sexy creative life and so I talk about my relationships that are important to me my friendship with you guys my drumming I talk about this and I'm talking to primarily 20 to 30, 30 year old adults that are themselves trying to move out of addiction if I can print my present myself as you guys do as a specimen of vitality, they don't want to be 62, but they'd like to be alive and they'd like to see somebody who is alive. I feel like in some ways it may be the greatest gift I give them. Somebody came up to me after the group yesterday and he, and he said, you know what makes your group the most popular group? I said, what is that? And he, and he said, he said, he said three things. He says, you're quick, you talk like a professor and you're not pretentious. <laughs> And I, I took all those in is what he's saying is that these guys uh, is that we're moving fast in the group. It's everything's, everything's game on. There's very little pretense because I'm very open to being fallible and I'm pretty freaking smart. <laughs> so why not show up with that? And I'm, I'm smart primarily because I don't have drugs coming in and fucking up that brain because I was addled for 10 or 15 years increasingly. So wasn't quite so smart then. And so I say all that with humility, but it's like, why not let that come through and that be the strongest voice that presents and, and, and that that creates, uh, you know, hopefully in our local sphere and then even what we're doing here creates a, a desire. It's like, I want to be, I want to be my own version of John. I want to be my own version of Doug. <clears throat> Doug and I cringe. It's like, oh my gosh, you know. Uh, no, I totally mean that. I totally mean that, John. I totally mean that. No, I, I, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, for me and, and just in my life, and because you know my background of being in cult and things, I was ashamed of about that. And I was like, people in recovery. I went, really? I was like, that's cool. Here's somebody who's taking some responsibility, accountability. He's looked inside and made some hard decisions you know how many people do that yeah, you know yeah. not so many and of course you have your people that just stopped using and they're like the dry drunk they really haven't cleaned up their act at all and they're you know just running around being but i don't think that's recovery but to me it's always been kind of an attractor and i've always admired gay people you know that have come out you know senators mm -hmm. and people mm -hmm. oh, the guy in charge of apple he just came out mm -hmm. a while back you know and he's mm -hmm. been tim tim what's his name tim cook or something like that yeah tim cook yeah, he's been, he's been a great leader. And thank you for doing that. I mean, this yeah, guy is like part of the most powerful company in the world. And he yeah. just, hey, I'm gay, so what? Yeah. And, 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 I, and I've seen that. I saw that since, since I was a, you know, a young man traveling in the world at, at a young age. And I ran into gay people. And I heard their stories. And I was like, wow. I really, I felt, I, I, well, I felt a kindred, a kinship, because I always felt like an outsider myself. In yeah. so many ways, I go, wow. Now, boy, if I had that, could I have dealt with it as well as you have? Or yeah. how would I have done that one? So, you know, the same thing with if you just take responsibility and show up. And it's like, it's also a thing we haven't mentioned recently on the podcast. But it's very much uh, the thing that's genetically determined, you know. I mean, almost I've done got hundreds of groups with people over the years. And one of the questions I always ask, do you have, you know, any history, you know, in your family? You know, grandparents, any uncles, aunts, whatever. And it's almost always, almost 100% yes. And so they're, they're in, in the Native American uh, culture, I had a uh, teacher, Wallace Blackout, for a number of years, who was a, a powerful Lakota medicine person and a big soul and uh, just a wonderful man and very kind to me. Mm -hmm. I, I was a wreck when he kind of took me on as a, and he, as a friend. And, and every time he'd come to the West Coast, I'd be with him and tr we'd travel around. And he was just, and I always, and I'd seen him really come down on people. And I was always, oh, he's going to, he's going to nail me one of these days because I'm such a mess. 
and he never did. He's probably this poor guy. <laughs> Life has done enough to me. I don't need to help. And, um, uh, but yeah, he was very aware when he told me about his family had been taken out by alcohol and, uh, you know, certain ethnic groups are much more susceptible to it. And so there's, there's just all kinds of indicators. You know, if you're Native American, do not drink, do not take drugs. You know, if you have it in your family, blah, 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 you better be really careful. And that's part about being honest. You can just be honest about those things. You know, it's like, um, Oh, you know, you're weak. You can't be like everybody. Well, no, you're being strong. You're being honest about, about, you know, your, your, your potential for, for, you know, getting this life sucking, you know, horrible downward spiraling disease that'll kill everything that's, that uh, matters in your life, you know? So it's just about being honest. Oh. And the thing about it is we can show up so much so much more effectively without this stuff coursing through our systems, you know, trying to let's, let's use the example of playing guitar. When I was deep in my addiction and the worst parts of it, I didn't pick up my guitar. I could not play, you know, my fingers didn't do what I wanted them to. And there were some other things going on there too, but uh, think about whatever it is that you're passionate about, whatever it is that you want to give and how much better you can do that when you're not, under the influence of stuff that's impairing your, your brain's ability to do what it's supposed to do. Our brains are incredible things. And if you look at successful people, you know, ones who even have used, I think how much higher they could have reached, how much more they could have created without this stuff. Think of yeah. in the music industry, all the tragic cases of people that we have lost early due to this thing and how much work they could have continued to contribute. And, you know, the, the growth and the artistry and the, blessings that they could have given to, to so many people by not touching this stuff anymore in business and, and industry. Think of the insights and the inventions and the things that are fundamentally beneficial to all of us that could have happened, not to mention, you know, your own wealth, if you can come up with better ideas, but to everyone too, mm -hmm. if you're not clouding yourself with this stuff. And so it's our responsibility and our gift to, show up in the best way we can so that we model what happens when you choose this kind of lifestyle, when you show up and do your practices, when you make yourself the best yeah. you can be, the most creative you can be, the strongest you can be, uh, you know, the smartest you can be, the most caring and compassionate you can be, the most spiritual you can be, whatever it is, when you show up and you model that, people start to see that, wow, this guy has something I want and yeah. it becomes the cool thing. Um, Oftentimes, and hopefully this is the end goal here, is without people having to go through that valley of bullshit in the first place to realize that because we're losing so much value in our lives, so many valuable years and, and valuable gifts. And some people don't ever recover that. If we can change the conversation and the people who have been through it too, certainly we have all done this, but starting to be honest about what's really cool and what's working for us now changes the cultural conversation. It starts to become that practice is the cool thing. Yeah. yeah. And hey, when, when you were in high school and it was, you know, I, I had less than a year of high school. I dropped out. But anyway, when you were in high school, Doug, did you see there were, I mean, it was okay not to use? Was there any pressure that you had to use or was it like, you know, hey, that person on you, he's kind of cool. What was it like when you were in school? Yeah, there, there certainly was some pressure to use there. Um, and I, I belong to sort of a different group, a different clique of the, uh, I, I found an identity in the rock and roll kids, the, the punk rock in particular. And, you know, the stoner kids and the goth kids were all one kind of big meta group of people who were not necessarily the, cool people as it were but even amongst those folks the the ones who and again I have discussed some of my backstory and what it was like growing up where I did in another episode but um even the kids who who were the bullies who were doing horrible things to us outcast kids were under a lot of social pressure to use and drink and you know I had I had some people that I knew who were going to those parties and there was a lot of shit around there. You couldn't escape it in that culture. And I don't know what things are like now, 20 years later, but man, back then 
yeah, you absolutely, no matter what group you were a part of, were pressured to experiment and to continue doing it. And, and not just to have a sip here and there, but to see how much you could consume, who could take the biggest hit or who could drink the most beer, whatever the particular thing was for those folks. And changing that again, because what, what high school kids think is cool comes from what their peers think is cool. And that comes also from what their role models, what the celebrities think is cool. A lot of this comes back to the social proof that we discussed with Holly during mm -hmm. our last episode. Um, mm -hmm. The social proof comes from our peer groups and the people we know and from the celebrity endorsements who we trust. The more people we see who we really respect who are doing cool things, um, actors, musicians, uh, athletes, whatever it may be, who are very clearly saying that they achieved their success, their athletic ability, their gifts of musicianship, their ability to act because they were staying away from this stuff, because they were doing these other practices, paying attention to their fitness, paying attention to their meditation, doing the emotional cleanup work, um, then it starts to become cool. We first of all, need to get the people who are in those positions to realize that it's okay to open up about your history. And this is not something that we have to hide from or be ashamed of. But also those of us who have not reached that level of notability to continue to put our best selves forward so that we can say, this is how we got here and be models for other people in a way that starts to diminish the acceptance of it. it's the same way that I have maybe incorrectly, but the same way that I have observed with smoking and the conversation around smoking just not being cool anymore. It's a certainly is an ongoing process too, because the practices never end. We continue to reach higher and higher as we dig into this. And you you reach a stage too where what your calling is, what your aspiration is becomes a part of the practice. And you reach deeper levels of soul and soul work through doing those things, through you know, musical exploration or John, in a recent episode, you talked about the yoga of winning and losing in tennis, which is absolutely brilliant. Uh, any kind of athletic competition, or maybe it's running a Spartan race. Maybe it's des designing sets for your high school musical and then moving on to designing brilliant sets for, for film and cinema, whatever it is you make bringing your best gifts, your best self to that as a way to, explore and and grow and yeah, that's, showing that's, up that's the yeah. payoff you know real real accomplishment you know really really deeply felt real accomplishment you know and, and one of the things about developmental psychology normally is like when kids are kids pre-adolescent you pretty much identify with your family okay you are your family and you have a, maybe have a best friend or two or something like that but it's you're really in your family and when you, when you go into adolescence you begin to move away from the parents and then the peer group okay becomes super important, you know, and it's really, it's really important to, to have, if you're an adolescent and, and always, but, but to have a peer group that supports you in, in good ways, you know, and uh, people that are healthy enough to get you through the, that weird transition of that adolescence, you know, that's kind of a teenagers and adolescents is kind of a new thing, you know, because, it used to be that you just go from being a kid, you'd be initiated in some way in tribal cultures. You didn't have six or seven years of being a, you know, a mid minch, you know, in, in between minch, not an unter minch or over minch, but a middle minch. And uh, that weird thing. And you would just go and you know, and, and kids were, the women were getting married at 13 as soon, as soon as they could bear children and things have changed a lot. So now we have this huge transitional period. And the problem is if you don't, find a group that's good enough that when you're getting into your, you know, early twenties, at that point you should be saying, well, you know, I really don't care that much what my peer group, um, you know, thinks I, I'm trying to find my own identity and you become more, well, I think I like pleated pants and, you know, and, and sport coats or something like that. And you start to in fashion and in your taste and your music, you know, I've, I, I really never liked that band, but I kind of had to go along because everybody thought they were cool. And you start exploring and finding your own self. And that's a really important part of becoming an adult. But if you didn't get the kind of healthy peer group and, and uh, 
uh, mentoring and adult role models, uh, you, that can, that, that period of adolescence can continue on for, you know, the rest of your life. You just kind of get stuck and you never quite make it. And, and uh, I'll say one model that I, I think I got this from Ken has been very helpful, but he talks about when, you know, imagine when you're born and we talked about this what was I talking about? Oh, with, uh, with uh, Dr. Flores the other day, when you're born, you have a hundred bucks in the bank and you know, you need X amount of dollars of these emotional psychic dollars to make the transitions in your life. And of course, you know, you, you go through, I don't know, your dad had problems. He didn't treat you right. Your mom didn't protect you from your dad. So you lose like, you know, 15 bucks when you're a kid. And, and then you get into uh, high school and you get bullied, blah, blah, blah. You leave another 15 or 10 or you start using drugs and that taking some money out of the bank. So by the time you get to make the transition to adulthood and you need about 83 bucks, you know, to make it. You know, you only have like 56 left and it's just like you, you try, you almost get there. You almost get a job. You almost start paying the rent. You almost, you know, go to college. You almost get a degree. You almost, 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 you almost have a relationship and it just never happens, you know? And the, the good news is I think that, that if, if you start doing the, the transformative work, the healing work, owning the shadow, healing the wounds, strengthening the body, deepening the spiritual uh, capacity, uh, strengthening your intellect with good stuff, with healthy stuff, then you can start getting some of those dollars back. And then you can, you know, okay, bam, 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 bam. Now I've got 92 and I only need 83. And you can make that, you can make that transition to the next level of your, your growth uh, healthily and really, and really solid. And you don't leave, you know, big chunks of yourself back in uh, adolescenthood. Because that stuff I'm, does get stuck back there in the adolescent. We stop growing and, and we stay at those levels of maturity. Uh, you explain that really well in your book, certainly. Um, and it's in uh, a lot of Ken's work as well. That This kind of thing just absolutely gets stuck at that particular level of development. And I'm thinking too about the stigma of sobriety in terms of the rites of passage of development. Uh, we have... These, these rites of passage that occur for us as we grow up, the milestones that tell us when we've reached a certain phase of life, when we're you know, becoming a man or, or graduating from high school or getting married, and all these festivals in our culture right now are associated with things like drinking, like using, maybe, maybe when you're younger, it's smoking your first cigarette or, or the first time, whatever it is, these unhealthy behaviors are all intimately tied in with the rituals we have right now. And so not participating in those particular rites of passage, does that mean that we never went through it? Well, absolutely not. And so part of destigmatizing this is going to be redefining the conversation about what the rites of passage are in our culture and showing up to it in a different way at those critical times so that it becomes a different part of the conversation that allows us to continue maturing in a healthy way without so many opportunities to get stuck and halt our development along that ladder, along that path, draining the bank account in the process. I think this way of talking uh, very much in the spirit of Holly Whitaker's uh, talking with us in the last group, I feel like it's really in the right direction. You guys, I feel like that, uh, just as an experiment, when I come to the groups that I lead, it's amazing to me to get men and women early in recovery from addiction that their primary reference group has been uh, others that are using. And what's amazing to me, it feels almost like an order of a miracle to me, is that within the context of a few weeks of meeting in a group, you can actually create a slight cultural shift to where values that really point towards living out my truth, living out my destiny, being the fullest I can be, those actually begin to ascend and it's palpable. You can feel it in the group where it, it early on, almost always, with some exceptions, almost always, the uh, young men and women uh, in recovery will be uh, what's called glorifying the addiction. You know, it's so cool. You know, you can't believe how much I use this kind of thing. But over the course of just a few sessions, a few weeks, it begins to shift. The, 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 the center of gravity begins to shift towards that's really not 
why I'm on this planet. That's not what I want to do. And if you can get a, John, you were talking about a peer group. If you can get the peer group beginning to reference other values, it begins to be less and less cool to hang on to glorifying the addiction and more and more uh, uh, admirable to be trying to identify what it is you want to do with your life and then getting on with it. I talked about uh, playing the guitar earlier and in sobriety, I discovered that, oh my gosh, I can play now and I could write now. And another really big part of that is that I was able to go to a concert, for example, and have so much more fun in sobriety than when I wasn't using. Yeah, I do um, know what you're talking about. <clears throat> I, and I can remember what happened. I can remember that yeah, experience. Yeah, I can save yeah. it. We We talk yeah. about going on vacations now and you know you want to go off to to some island somewhere and lay on the beach and drink rum or whatever the case may be for you but i have discovered in sobriety that i have so much more fun and have the memories forever when i'm not doing that mm -hmm. and we become to uh bob to what you were saying earlier we become the average of the five people that we spend the most time with Right, and so I think that that's why that starts to that's nice. shift I when we get into these groups. So, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that as we as we start to get clear about these things and and determine the values that are important to us, the things we care about, and make efforts to enjoy them and participate in them to the best of our ability, to a place where we're rem remembering them, and then show up and bring that to groups of others, it spreads almost virally, and. Yeah it's a it's a beautiful thing to witness it's a beautiful thing to observe yeah and in early recovery you really have to make some hard decisions about friendships you know yeah you can't you, uh, you can't hang out with a bunch of people that are using and stay sober it's just you just can't do it and and it's even if you could it wouldn't be in your best interest that was my central barrier to acknowledging that I had a problem with alcohol and with drugs is that I, I could see the handwriting on the wall as I'm going to lose my best friends. Uh, and I did. And I did. It was, it was, it, it took like Holly was saying last episode, it took being taken to my knees, just almost taken down and out to be willing. Is, is it worth for me, worth it for me to die to sustain my friendships? And finally, the equation shifted where, no, it's not. But it took really kind of gun to head for me to give that up because I realized what I was doing. And it, in fact, ended up that way because I was, I was the – I remember one time working at Passages in Rehab, and, and one of the parents of one of the people in the, uh, in the, in, in the facility came in wearing a T-shirt that said, Rehab is for losers. You can imagine how inspiring that was to this, this, uh, this particular individual's child. But – but uh, there's very much a sense that when I entered into my own, let's call it rehabilitation, that I now I was branded as a loser. This gets back to that kind of reverse stigma is that it was exceedingly uh, costly for me to enter into my own sobriety because it was at the expense of those. And they weren't congratulating me. I was being branded as a, as a loser. Really painful, John. Really painful. Wow. <clears throat> and something for someone with a lower uh, level of, of self-development and self-esteem, self-image than a normal healthy person would have a particularly hard time with this. But part of the key is realizing that the path I'm doing, the path I'm choosing is better. And this is not to put oneself above anybody else by any means, but to say that choosing, choosing this other path, this path of practice, this path of sobriety and recovery lifts the fog from my eyes and all these other people even if they've not fallen so far down the rabbit hole there's a there are blinders on there there's a cloud there's a haze there's a truth that they're not seeing and i'm going to choose something different um finding the strength to do that is incredibly difficult and that's one of the reasons that practice is so important because that's how we start to build those things through the self-belief that is empowered through sticking with the practices on a daily basis. Yeah. Then you develop grit, you know, that word has come up here and that's the, the ability to, to uh, delay gratification or not do instant gratification and longer in order to achieve long-term goals, you know, and you know, after, and then after a while practice becomes a pleasure, you know, I just love working out and some days I don't, 
want to go, but I always feel better when I do. And, uh, you know, I'll drag myself and, and do it. But yeah, it, it, it doesn't become that hard after a while, you know, just taking a shower, you know, every month, like I didn't, no, I'm kidding every day, you know, has that become this, just this great burden? No, it's just what you do. You know, it's just, you know, it, it becomes easier and easier. And, and, and the more, um, the, the more we mature and get stronger, the, the more fun it gets too, you know? And, and, you know, it's, and in the beginning and early recovery, you can't save anybody but yourself. You know, you just have to be really rigorous. And, you know, I love you guys. We had some good times, some bad times, but I got to go away, you know, yeah. because I can't. Yeah. Yeah. And just that honesty, whether they act, oh, well, screw you, man, or something like that. Part of, part of them, or maybe some of the people are thinking, wow, I really kind of need to be doing that. And that's why they get mad at you. You know, I've, I've had people growing up in families where, you know, they get together and everybody just gets soused, you know, and then one goes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come and say hello, but I can't, I, I, I can't hang around here because I've chosen not to drink and I, I can't not drink when I'm with you guys. So I love you, but I got to go and be, you know, oh, but you know, that is a hell of a statement. You know, and the truth hurts, man, but the truth also saves and gives life and lies and cover ups and codependency kill. You know, so it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth yeah. the sacrifice. <laughs> no doubt about it. I like what you said, Doug. It's about your life. It's about saving your life and it's it's worth it to save our lives. <clears throat> and certainly when we're making different choices, we risk being ostracized from our peer groups. And one of the real gifts of the time we're living in is what technology empowers us to do and how easy it makes it to find other people who share our beliefs, who share our values, even if they're not in our immediate vicinity. And this is possible now in a way that even 20 years ago, it was not. We can connect with there are people all over the world who are listening to this podcast and connecting with like-minded people, you know, the community that's forming around this or <laughs> whatever else it is that, that drives you, that inspires you, that you know in your heart is right. Even if the people in your family, in your town, in your high school, your college, even if they don't agree, you can find people who will be a positive influence on you. All you have to do is sit down at the computer you know, pull your smartphone out of your pocket and take a look because we're all here and we're grateful to see everyone, everyone new who can participate in this journey with us. Yeah. Just this morning, there were two of us on the West coast of the United States in conversation with two of our uh, journey of integral recovery, po uh, Facebook group members. One was in Denmark and one was in Switzerland. So here we are, Washington, California, Switzerland, and Denmark. I feel more in kinship with the four of us in transaction, uh, this morning than I do with these, these former friends that I'm telling you about. I mean, that's where, that's where the new family is. I certainly feel it with you guys and we're, we're separated by hundreds, if not thousands of miles. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, but by the way, we've never been, the three of us have never been in the same room together. But soon that will be rectified. October Palo Alto or bust. Yeah. yeah so that will be, uh, I can't be wait. Better. Can't wait. That's awesome. Yeah. And we're going to the, uh, uh, Trans Tech Transformational Technology Conference in Palo Alto. We mm -hmm. last year. Dear Doug's mm -hmm. going with us, mm -hmm. and you know that's a whole other peer group of people we're trying to use technology yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to to help people evolve and grow. You know, yeah, and yeah. Uh, then we were invited a few days later. So we just, to the Sands. It's the uh, uh, Science and Non Duality Conference. Mm -hmm. And this year, uh, they're focusing on transformational technology, and we were invited to be part of that. That's good. So, you know, and so you find, you know, so you find your dentist, your identity, though you are in recovery. Well, yeah, that's great. Good for you. I mean, everybody needs to be in recovery and everybody needs to be a practitioner. Uh, as far as an integral practitioner, work these parts of yourself. But then you begin to find other peer groups, you know, that don't center around not using or using or this or that and the other, you know, as you grow and expand and find your gifts, you're led into, into, um, you know, into that and, and you know you look at and the music you know i mean look at the the guys who've survived you know the, the music, they went through their drug things they got honest with themselves totally recommend clapton's book uh by mm -hmm. clapton mm -hmm. what a wonderful story and uh, mm -hmm. uh the struggle that he went through and he's been you know continued a really good man humble man very human man mm -hmm. i heard a story some guy went to the 
uh, some mansion in um, <laughs> London to deliver all these potted plants. And there was this guy sitting there at the doorstep says, Hey, can you help me unload my truck? And so, anyway, later he drove off and later he found that it was Eric Clapton, you know, that was helping him do this guy's has like million dollar fingers and hands. And he was all, oh, oh, sure. You know, and that's just the, the uh, kind of the, uh, I'm not going to say the stink, but the odor of his humility and his, his honest self. He's, he's very, uh, you know, for, you know, from being God, you know, in the psychedelic era, Eric Clapton is God to being the man he is now. It's just tremendous. Yeah, that it we can continue to create and evolve and be, mm-hmm. you know, just decent people, you know, otherwise too. You know. And so many of the people that we lost, you know, what would have been like to have Jimi Hendrix at 40 still playing, you know, on and on. So, well, thank you all to, uh, for being here today. Um, thank you guys for another great conversation. Thank you to all the listeners tuning into this episode and, uh, come visit us online, integral recovery institute.com. Uh, you can download your free deep Delta meditation and get started on your integral practice. Uh, visit the community page to join up with us and start to find some of these people who are, who are moving in the right direction, who are doing the practices and will help all of us together. Um, grow into the best versions of ourselves and change the world, change our own lives and, and have a more rewarding experience for us, for our friends, for our families, for a better world and uh, certainly better life for all of us. Yeah. And, and Doug, you, is, there, uh, is there an email address that people can email us if they have comments or questions they'd like us to answer on the show? I think it'd be, uh, it would be delightful. Yeah, um, there's a, a contact form on our website is probably the easiest way. Uh, if you go to integralrecoveryinstitute.com and click on the contact button, uh, it'll pop up a form that sends it straight to our email addresses. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments. Um, love interacting with everybody. And do you have any suggestions for particular things you would like us to discuss that you're curious about? Practice, theory, recovery, whatever it is, just uh, send us your emails and let us know. Great. Awesome. Great job, you guys. All right. All right, thank you.